Hello, everybody, and welcome to the National Digital Inclusion Alliance Digital Inclusion 101 webinar. Before we begin, please make sure that your name includes your pronouns and organizations on your Zoom name. We want to make sure that we refer to you correctly if you're, if you're asking questions or typing in the chat. And in order to do that, go ahead and hover over your profile, click on the three dots, and then press rename. All right, so we're gonna take just a few seconds, go ahead and introduce yourself in the chat by sharing your name, your pronouns, the city that you're at and the organization that you're with. And most importantly, I want you to share your Starbucks order. I want to know what you're ordering and Lo and I will share our Starbucks order when we um, introduce ourselves. So go ahead and do that. Also, if you're not a Starbucks person, um, you are welcome to share your other um, special beverage order. So I I am aware of the divide between the Starbucks slash Pete slash Caribou slash Duncan debate. Um, we acknowledge that, we see you, but we still wanna know what your ridiculous drink is. <laughs> okay, Paolo, iced Americano, classic. Okay, okay. All right, so. Ooh, Caitlin, ooh. Lychee boba with mango jelly. I don't know who posted that, but I'm, I'm gonna hang out with them. That's Denise. Denise, find me in the future. If we're ever at the same conference or organization, we're, we're going. Lindsay, a Starbucks order is never boring. Plain tall dark roast with oat milk. Sounds classic to me. All right, so in the respect of everybody's time, we're gonna go ahead and get started with the agenda. So answering the first important questions everybody has, yes, this webinar will be recorded. It's actually being recorded right now. Um, and the slides will be sent over and everything is hyperlinked. So you're gonna have access to that. You'll also have a resource guide afterwards with all the links that we're going to share in the chat. Um, and this uh, webinar will also be on our YouTube page as well. So I hope that answers a big question. So as you see, we got a lot to cover today. We're gonna to first introduce NDIA for those folks who are new to our community. Then we're gonna go into defining digital inclusion key definitions. Then we're going to talk about understanding the barriers to digital inclusion. We're gonna talk about the three key solutions, but there's many more. Um, then we're gonna shift over and talk about the digital navigators model, talk about the importance and roles of coalitions, policy and funding, and then joining the NDA community. And then hopefully we have some time for questions and comments in the end. All right. Now, just want to make sure we are recording. Yes, okay, perfect. All right. So I want to take a moment and acknowledge the indigenous peoples of the lands that we are on today. While we meet today virtually, it's important that we acknowledge the importance of the land. And as a community dedicated to the ideals of inclusion and equity, I encourage all of us to evaluate the ongoing effects of settler colonialism and our participation in that process. And as digital inclusion practitioners committed to digital equity, we must understand and listen to local indigenous peoples so that we don't continue the legacy and harm of colonialization into our digital inclusion work. All right, so um, I will introduce myself and pass it over to Lo. So hello, everybody. My name is Pamela Rosales, pronouns she, hers. I am the training and community engagement manager with NDIA. I reside in the Kikuku land, uh, uh, known as Chicago, and my Starbucks, my favorite Starbucks drink, it's a classic, it's basic, it's the venti ice white mocha, soy milk, no whip, two bottles of caramel, and light ice, all right? And I will be trying a lot of the drinks that you all put in the chat because it sounds really good. All right, Lo, could you introduce yourself and please share the important question of what is your Starbucks order? You said yours was basic and then you said it and I was very impressed. Um, my name is Lo Smith, I am uh, pronouns they, them. I am a senior programs manager with NDIA. I am coming to you live from Piscataway Konoy land, also known as Baltimore, Maryland. And my Starbucks order is a shaken oat milk brown sugar espresso. Um, 
or truly anything with oat milk and espresso involved and ice. Mix it up in any direction, I will take it. <laughs> awesome, perfect, perfect. I see a lot of oat milks in the chat. I see you, oat milk people. All right, so let's talk about NDIA. Let's define it for those who are new to our community. NDIA, we are the National Digital Inclusion Alliance and we advance digital equity by supporting community programs and equipping policymakers to act. We are a nonprofit representing and serving more than 660 US organizations in over 47 states, working for affordable broadband, access to devices and digital skills training and support. We are here because we believe that with digital equity, we all win. So let's define these three important terms when doing digital inclusion work. You might have heard some of these things um, used interchangeably, but they each mean clear and specific things. So first, let's define digital equity. It's a condition in which all individuals and communities have the information technology capacity needed for full participation in our society, democracy, and economy. So that participation can look like feeling confident showing up in a virtual interview, knowing that your internet is stable, but it can also look like knowing how to go on Facebook Live to record a hate crime in order to protect yourself. Digital equity is more than just learning how to use a keyboard or having internet access or an updated device. It's also about reclaiming power. Think about the ways that digital equity gives power back to survivors and gives them a platform to hold their abusers accountable and spark the hashtag MeToo movement. This is why we do the work that we do so that everybody can participate online in the way that they want to, if they want to. Next, um, it's digital inclusion. So digital equity is the goal and digital inclusion is the work. It's the activities necessary to achieve digital equity. It's the work that you are all doing. And we're going to go into detail throughout the presentations about what these activities look like to achieve digital equity. And then we have the digital divide, which is the issue. It's the gap between those who have affordable access, digital skills and support to effectively engage online and those who do not. And the digital divide disproportionately affects those who are already impacted by oppressive systems like racism, classism, colonialism, transphobia, ableism, and much more. And because broadband isn't viewed as a civil right or utility for everyone to meet their basic needs, and instead you see major internet service providers viewing broadband with profit as the end goal, you see the digital divide impacting people of color, indigenous peoples, people with disabilities, and households with low income being digitally excluded. And as practitioners, we also get to decide if we want to continue this divide. It can be easy to point our fingers at institutions or companies, but we as practitioners and advocates um, also have power and a say on whether or not our organizations and our interactions with the communities that we serve perpetuate racism and classism. For example, are the solutions being created by Black, Indigenous, and people of color in your community? or are they only being viewed and seen as a client? And terms and language around the issue can also perpetuate harm as well. So terms like digital native or digital immigrant, we need to ask ourselves, what are the implications of using these terms centered around citizenship and what type of solutions would come from looking at the digital divide through a colonial framework? All right, so now we're going to do a Jamboard activity um, there's going to be a link in the chat um, for you to access the, the Jamboard. For those who are not familiar with Jamboard, here's a quick instruction. You're, in order to um, create a sticky note, you're going to press the fourth icon on the left module, you see right there, and then you can go ahead and type in the text that you want on the sticky note, press save, and you can essentially blow up the Jamboard with as many um, sticky notes as you want. So I'm going to pause my screen share so I can go to the Jamboard with you all. Awesome. Okay, I see that somebody already knows what they're doing. Kudos to you. So I want to ask you all, what prevents people in your community from consistently um, connecting to the internet and using it effectively? I just want to give a few minutes for people to brain dump all the ways in which that connection is in your community. All right, we have cost. We, have, we see digital redlining, lack of access to connect to the internet, 
Some, someone wrote, some neighborhoods aren't wired for a connection, that's, for internet connection, that's right, that infrastructure isn't there. Lack of infrastructure in rural mountainous areas. Um, we have cost of devices. Thank you for bringing up devices, that's awesome. Lack of skills training, absolutely. You know, how do you get on WhatsApp? <laughs> um, rural areas with no broadband. I'm seeing a lot of themes here of devices, lack of devices, um, a lot of internet, discussion on internet, whether it's affordability or the infrastructure isn't there. Home situation, living situation. Okay, absolutely. Poor quality internet, yes. Just because it's affordable, just because it's present, it also has to be reliable. Okay, so you guys are all clearly really smart. Um, inaccessible language and services and or training. Yes, yes, thank you for acknowledging that. For those who um, don't speak English and for those whose alphabet isn't the Roman alphabet, it can be difficult to gain those digital skills if it's not catered to their language as well as their culture. Broadband, broadband exclamation point. Okay. Lack of access to proper training and acknowledgement about the importance of internet and what it provides to households. Absolutely, thank you to the person who wrote that down. Um, people need to understand why broadband is relevant to them. Some people might think, well, it's not important to me, but then they, uh, they, they need to meet with their doctors online or something like that, you know? So bridging that um, understanding and trust is super, is, is very vital. Misconceptions about the what the internet is and what it can do for them, absolutely. Oh, we have somebody in the chat, Caitlin. I work with older adults and the main barrier is age because they are hesitant with learning new technology since they see it as complicated and something they cannot learn to use. Absolutely, thank you for sharing that, Caitlin. Chuck wrote fear and anxiety. Um, Amber wrote lack of infrastructure, yes. Okay. There's just so much on here. Okay, so thank you all for putting that in there. Go ahead and continue to add more on here throughout the presentation. You will have access to this Jamboard. This is also great data, you know, just doing digital inclusion advocacy work in your own community. You're seeing how it's in, impact, impacting other folks and I'm sure you're seeing the same in your communities as well. All right, so let me pause and get back to the presentation. All right, we're able to see my screen. Okay, so in 2020, um, we published a white paper on how limiting broadband investment to rural only discriminates against black Americans and other communities of color. In it, we highlight the excessive focus on broadband deployment into rural areas, which are predominantly white non-Hispanic populated areas, and the lack of deployment into urban communities. And this policy framework is counterproductive and structurally racist because in general, non-Hispanic white Americans are more likely than other racial groups to have broadband subscriptions, while Black Americans and other people of color are less likely. Also, most urban communities in the United States have more residents who lack broadband services than do most rural counties and the residents in those households without broadband were people of color. Next, um, somebody in the Jamboard mentioned digital redlining. Y'all are already on the next step. But for those who don't know what digital redlining is, it's discrimination by internet service providers or ISPs for short in deployment, maintenance and upgrade of delivery services. So in lower income communities, they don't receive the service that the higher income community um, gets because internet service providers, um, they view it as a commercial service and they don't see internet access as a civil right. So they have no reason to serve everyone equitably, right? So if we look on the map on the right, um, in 2017, NDIA alongside Connect Your Community conducted a mapping analysis of FCC broadband availability in Cleveland. And we found that AT&T systemically discriminated against lower income Cleveland neighborhoods and its deployment of home internet and video technologies over the past decade. So the picture shows Cleveland, the red are neighborhoods with high poverty rates and the green is where the fiber enhanced broadband improvements were made. So ultimately, AT&T withheld the fiber enhanced broadband improvements from most Cleveland neighborhoods with high poverty rates. 
Cheryl, you wrote that you're from Chicago. We should meet up. I'm from Chicago as well. Okay, moving on. <laughs> so we're gonna talk about some key barriers to digital inclusion. Oftentimes when people think about the issues of affordable broadband, we tend to think of it as an issue that only impacts rural communities. But again, data would show us that broadband inequity is a rural and community issue, rural and urban community issue. So based on data from the American Community Survey, 36 million households in total are without wireline internet access. 26 million of those homes are in urban areas, while 10 million of those households are in rural areas. So as data shows, more households in urban areas are without wireline internet access. So we have to make sure that when we are looking at the issue of broadband equity, we aren't focusing on providing solutions that only rural communities can benefit from. Broadband um, is also another barrier as we all it looks like you all know that in the Jamboard, which is awesome. So broadband access, it's a civil rights issue because it impacts nearly all fundamental aspects of our lives. When everyone has access to affordable high-speed internet, it means improvements in things like accessibility. For example, people who are People who are blind or visually impaired can use screen reader programs that audibly describe website materials to users. It also um, is increased in public health and telehealth and civic engagement where people can vote and community organize and also entertainment, right? It doesn't have to be these really heavy things. I truly believe that we all deserve the opportunity to scroll endlessly on TikTok till 2 a.m. We should all have that right. So broadband equity, it's not the same as availability. Availability is simply the question of, can you get connected to the internet? Just because the infrastructure exists in a community, it doesn't necessarily tell us who's adopting or using that internet at home. So availability isn't taking into consideration the price of that connection, the speed of that connection, or if it's reliable. All right. The last thing I'll talk about when it comes to broadband is the difference between unserved and underserved. So unserved is an area that has no broadband infrastructure. So folks in that area cannot connect to the internet. There's no wire on the ground that comes to their house to connect to broadband, or there are no cell phone towers to reach their house for them to access a hotspot. On the other hand, under, underserved, excuse me, is the significant gaps and variances in internet speed, reliability, and affordability. So of course, so a person could connect to the internet, but there are many factors limiting that, like having too slow of an internet connection. For example, if a community is paying $130 a month, but they still can't stream Netflix, then it's not affordable and it's too slow. Okay, so a question I want to ask you, you can just answer it yourself, and something to ask ourselves as we do our work is if everyone had free access to fast and reliable internet, would that solve the digital divide? The answer is no. <laughs> so there are other barriers that need to be addressed in order to get people to use the internet in the way that they want to. So another barrier to digital equity is affordable, adequate, and appropriate devices. So the digital divide and device ownership disproportionately impacts people with disabilities. As you see here, only 62% of adults with a disability own a desktop or a laptop compared to the 81% of adults without a disability. So to tackle the barrier, devices have to be affordable, adequate, and appropriate. And Lo will talk more about that soon. Next is digital skills. If someone has reliable internet and the newest device, but they don't know how to access and navigate it, then it's still incomplete. So when looking at remote work, it's driving demand for having these digital skills. In 2019 report done by the US Department of Education, they found that 52 million adults do not have necessary digital skills, which is about 16% of the US population in 2019. But digital skills can financially improve someone's life, absolutely. But outside of a job, having digital skills allows folks um, to FaceTime with their families overseas, to check their balance on their credit card before they walk into Target, go hard in Target, or meet their doctor virtually, right? It's not just about jobs. It can be all those other aspects of your life. And here are some additional barriers. Um, language access, somebody had mentioned that in the Jamboard, if the digital skills training, um, if it's not accessible to different languages, then you're missing key populations in your community. I wanna also highlight jargon. Um, it's, it can be 
very gatekeepy to use jargon. And um, so if you're not defining what your acronyms mean, you keep saying ISP or ACP, but people aren't familiar with that. And oftentimes you're going to be neglecting new folks who can be coming from those communities that we're aiming to serve, BIPOC folks, trans and um, queer folks, um, people with disabilities. If you're using jargon that is exclusionary and you're not meeting your members where they're at, we're not getting new ideas and we're going to continue this digital divide in our own work. Um, and lastly, solution makers, they don't reflect the communities that they serve. So there's a huge disconnect there. All right. So now I will pass it over to Lo on the solutions for um, solving the digital divide. Awesome. Thanks so much, Pamela. So the good news is Pamela managed to share with us all of the slightly terrifying things that are massive barriers to any level of digital inclusion that we can see in society. But she shared them with us because we have solutions and we're working on solutions. We're not just here to name the problems. We're here to talk about what we're doing together. So on the next slide, you'll see our first solution, affordable and low cost broadband. There's a reason I'm saying the words affordable and low cost, because what is affordable to me is not the same as what's affordable to you. And low cost is something that we can agree on universally. I like to think about the Arizona iced tea. It's always been 99 cents. It will always be 99 cents. That's always gonna be a low cost option you can grab from the corner store. Some of us will find that to be an affordable drink, some of us are still going for like a 50 cent Fago. So it's up to you, it's affordable, but low cost is universal. On our next slide, I've got a thought for you just as we progress on this entire presentation. How have barriers to connectivity impacted your community or your clients? Depending on what you actually do, this may be um, a very different answer for each one of you. Feel free to answer it in the chat or just reflect on it as I explain broadband a little bit more. So what is broadband? On my next slide, I get into it. Broadband, we're talking about broadband, and I do want to take a moment to acknowledge that broadband is slightly different from some of the other networks and gap networks that we have seen trying to solve the digital divide during the current pandemic we're still in, as well as during previous projects. Broadband is when you have connectivity that is strong. Often it is a wire line. It is something that comes into your home. So it is the transmission of um, data over a high-speed internet connection. High-speed is key. Back in 2015, we called this high-speed. We thought that we only needed 20 megabits for downloading and three megabits for uploading. For all of you who currently have your cameras off, probably so that you can hear and see me a little bit better, we know that is not the case. That was because the internet used to be a one-way road for us. We were taking things in. We were not putting things back out at the same rate. Now we know that Zoom, gaming, streaming, everything involves a give and take between our devices and even ourselves. So thinking about what high speed would actually mean is a fun um, sort of thought process. Um, and then thinking about broadband adoption. So on the next slide, um, we have some details about what is broadband adoption with daily access to the internet. So we're thinking about, we need folks to have the speed, the quality um, and the ability to complete their necessary tasks. My internet is holding up right now. As a resident of Baltimore City, a heavily digitally redlined city, that's not always the case. Sometimes when I'm presenting with one of my colleagues who's in a rural area, she is not able to screen share with me. We do not have the speed, the quality or the capacity to do our jobs. And we are digital inclusion professionals. Um, broadband, uh, Adoption also impacts the ability to not only establish and build these digital skills, but to be able to continue to develop them relevant to the current online state of things. Um, and you also do need a device to be able to get online. So these are all parts of the solutions regarding broadband and low cost options. I've got a trivia question for you on my next slide. Are you ready? I need somebody to guess in the chat, either that or just somebody unmute yourself um, willy nilly and yell out a city. Somebody, anybody, yell out a city. We got a beat. Somebody says New York. Somebody say one aloud. I heard in New York. Uh, Milwaukee. Milwaukee. All right. Chattanooga. Chattanooga. Chattanooga had it first. Let's check the next slide to see what city was ranked the best work from home city in 2021. Camilla, what do we have here? It's Chattanooga. Gig City. 
So this is the first city in the US to roll out a fiber network. So when we're saying fiber, that's generally the stuff that's buried in the ground rather than the stuff that's gonna be like um, necessarily coming over poles or through any kind of satellite, if you've heard about um, Starlink or anything like this, but fiber often buried in the ground. Um, it's a really great way to ensure that you're going to have high speed access for broadband. Um, and Chattanooga installed that throughout their city to every single household. Um, that resulted in free high speed Wi Fi to all of the students. That was 18,000 households who qualified for free or reduced lunch in Chattanooga. If you can picture your city and envision what would happen if every single one of your households that receives free or reduced lunch had free high speed internet, I think that that is one of the biggest solutions we can think of for ensuring that broadband is available, impactful, and also providing that solution to the digital divide. But some of the work that we're doing is making sure that we can get that to everyone's homes. So on my next slide, I have some resources so that you can explore this topic more, specifically looking into the Affordable Connectivity Program. Um, this is something that we would love to share more with you. It would be a huge disservice for me to try to go over all of what the Affordable Connectivity Program is during this webinar today. So please take a look at our one webinar we have recorded on this, as well as many of our sort of pages and resources on this. This is a discount program that allows households in the United States and the territories to be able to engage in a low cost internet option. We also have a free and low cost internet um, sort of like guide on our website. And we have a broadband research database so that you can look more into solutions that folks are using to ensure that broadband is accessible and available to communities. Okay. I know that was a lot on broadband and that was all very quick, but I do encourage you to do a little bit more exploring on our website, follow up with us and join our listserv because that's where the real conversations will take place. Because I'm about to hop into another solution, which is appropriate and affordable devices. Here's another time that I like to pause and take a look at the language that I'm using here. I'm saying appropriate and affordable. I think many of us have been thinking about the affordability of devices for many of our community members, but often that means that we are providing subpar devices. We've all encountered moments where someone comes to us needing help, whether they're a family member, a friend, or a community member, and they may not have the device that they really need for that interaction. On my next slide, I sort of have a breakdown of what makes a device appropriate versus maybe not appropriate for some interactions. Um, we're thinking about smartphones versus tablets versus computers, but we also understand there are plenty of other ways that folks have been getting online. One of my favorite examples is during my time in libraries. I am a former public librarian. I had a community member who preferred to do all of his internet browsing via his PS4. That was not an appropriate device for the situation. However, every day I worked with him to help him to learn how to explore the internet through his PS4 because that's what he preferred and I respected that. However, I did try to push him towards a more appropriate device here and there. What we're thinking about is um, sort of the negative and positive for each device and making sure that our community members have what they need. If you need a, um, a device that has a long battery life, you're just using mostly apps, perhaps a smartphone is truly it for you. We do not wanna discount the current work that folks are doing on their smartphones. Same thing for tablets. If you are there to experience virtual joy, you just need to FaceTime with your family members, you want to watch Netflix, and you want to make sure that you're getting your Wordle in every day, maybe a um, tablet and more of like a handheld device is the right thing for you. But if you're somebody like me who works remotely for an organization, you may need a laptop. And it may be a little bit tougher for you to get access to a laptop when you're first starting at a job. I'll even admit, I worked from my old grad school laptop for the first month that I was with NDIA because I was waiting to figure out what the most appropriate work device would be for me to purchase. And I think I would like to thank everybody on my team for their patience while I worked to get myself the appropriate device I needed for this job. On the next slide, um, I just wanna share with you some details about an organization that is working to make sure that these appropriate devices can make them into the hands of our community members. When you're thinking about acquiring devices for your community, whether you are in a library, you're setting up your own community space with devices, 
the options aren't just um, direct from manufacturers, Best Buy, et cetera. There are a number of nonprofit organizations working nationally to ensure that devices are able to make them into the hands of community members who require them. Some of the excellent things here too is that these devices are benefiting our communities in multiple ways. For example, they are often refurbished. They are cutting down on um, the damaging experiences that used devices can have on our ecosystems. And I think a lot of us have seen the way that waste and um, improperly cared for waste can impact our cities. Um, and this is um, just one example, Digitunity. Um, take a look at their website and um, see if they may be a benefit for you. There are quite a few different organizations doing the similar work, but we just wanted to give them a shout out because they've been doing this since the mid eighties. Um, and this is also a moment that I want to acknowledge. Digital inclusion work isn't new. While Camilla and I may look young and excited, we've been doing this for a pretty long time. Um, and this is something that has been around and will continue to be around. And there are many, many different options for looking into devices, affordable devices and appropriate devices that may be available in your community. Those organizations may have been around for a pretty long time too. When you're looking at other resources from us, on the next slide, um, I will just point out that our startup manual does have some great guides on helping you to decide what devices may be appropriate for your digital inclusion program, helping you to get started and giving you some examples of ways that you can facilitate your own PC refurbishing, as well as some other folks that you may want to connect with, including some of our friends over at PCs for People. Had to shout them out too, truly adore them. Also a quick plug on the startup manual. Um, at the time of the recording of this webinar and for all of y'all here in the audience, we are going to be doing a bit of a revamp on this. So please keep an eye out for a startup manual that will have a little more information and feel particularly relevant to 2022 next. That was a lot on devices, but don't worry. We've got one more thing that we really wanna talk about. One of the solutions is ensuring that we are getting digital skills trainings available to our community members. Thinking about what our digital skills foundations even are can be super tough. What do people need to know to survive? Luckily on the next slide, I've got a couple examples. So when we're thinking about digital skills training, I think many of us are here today because we have been given direction to learn about digital inclusion, learn about digital equity. And one of those things is how do we help people learn how to become digitally literate. I often would have community members walk into my library and say, I'm computer illiterate. And I would go, well, that sounds a bit dramatic, but let's get started together. But often trying to figure out what exactly we needed to learn and how to break that down was a little tough when we were just working together on our own. The good news is we've got your back here. The Essential Digital Skills Framework um, has provided some really great ways to sort of break down how people are able to work with their devices and if they are able to meet their specific needs, starting with being able to turn on a device, interacting with their home screens, connecting to Wi-Fi, and then building out to bigger skills. One of the things that I often like to focus on is making sure that we acknowledge where folks already are in their work. And when we're thinking about digital skills, most people have more digital skills than you would expect. So especially acknowledging the digital skills our community members already have, and then working to build them out. Um, one great example of some digital skills um, engagement is the Tech League. And this was created by the Salt Lake City Public Library. On my next slide, I've got a bit of a, a um, description of it. And this was about providing one-on-one -on -one assistance to community members um, who are in underrepresented groups to help them to develop those digital skills. And often we're seeing that one-on-one -on -one assistance can be really useful and really helpful. Often for me, one of the things I see when it comes to digital literacy and digital skills training is that it takes a little bit of um, acknowledgement of the emotions that we have surrounding our engagement with those specific items, devices, whatever it is, working through that emotional side before we can get to the skills. But if we're just thinking skills and skills alone, on the next slide, I've got some examples from us at NDIA on some resources. Down at the bottom, there's a link to a blog post I wrote. Um, thanks, Pamela, for sticking that in there. And we have some multilingual resources that are super useful. We have GCF Learn Free as well as Digital Learn. These are some self-paced guides. So if you're really looking to be able to offer specific little lessons to your community members, they're really fantastic for this. Um, and those two, as well as the Mozilla Foundation, often they have um, guides for facilitators. So helping you 
to learn how to be able to provide instruction on these different topics so that you're not just sort of trying to figure out, well, how would I teach someone how to use Microsoft Word? They provide a little bit more support as well as some understanding and some introduction to sort of how to begin to engage and teach. I know. It's been a lot. I've just covered three different solutions. I've covered digital skills trainings. I've covered appropriate devices. I have covered broadband. This can be really exhausting to think about trying to cover all of these in our organizations. And I like to remind everybody that we don't have to do it all at once, but we do have one specific group who are looking to do it all at once. And those are our digital navigators. Early on in the pandemic, um, NDIA, prior to my joining, prior to Pamela's joining, um, started bringing together the community, and that's y'all, to create the digital navigators. This was sort of a combination of best practices of like, what are y'all doing in order to make sure that your communities are able to receive the support that they need? So they looked into the three areas of need, the devices, the skills training, the connectivity, and they created this written out model of what folks were already doing. And then the whole team named it Digital Navigators. And today we are providing support for a program model that is really built to do one-on-one -on -one digital inclusion work. We are stacking all of these different topics into one and having a person available and ready to provide assistance, whether it's over the phone, in person, on Zoom, or by chat, to do really learner-centric approaches helping people with both live and asynchronous, so video and also leading them through things, um, instruction. And we made this a model. We made this an open source option for all of y'all. So on the next page, um, you can take a look at the digital navigator model and the resources. This is not a secret. We don't want this to be a secret. Please, please, please take a look at the digital navigator model. We have a whole guide to how you can replicate this exact program within your community down to the forms we've used for data collection, the job description that you can copy and paste to look for volunteers or paid staff members, as well as a webinar too, that you can learn a little bit more about what a digital navigator is and what they're doing within their communities. The thing is, Digital navigators very rarely work alone. Often they are supported by other organizations and they are guiding people specifically to these other resources rather than doing that work all on their own. And this is really important when you're thinking about people coming together collectively. So Pamela is gonna share a little bit more about what it means when we come together to do digital inclusion work, sharing that common goal and working towards digital equity. Thank you, Lo. So yes, as organizations and practitioners, you're definitely not alone in serving your community. And this is where we talk about coalitions. So what are coalitions? They are a collective of organizations like local governments, libraries, education institutions, housing authorities, social services, and civic organizations, to name a few. They operate in the public realm with a certain degree of transparency about its activities, governance, and finances. And they also function within a collaborative structure that can include process for decision-making, leadership responsibilities, hosting regular meetings, whether it's monthly or multiple times a month, and having an open process for joining. So there are three effects of um, that, there are three effects that coalitions have on their member organizations and participants in the community. So the first effect is the advocacy effect. Coalitions focus local attention on the issue of digital inclusion as a specific area for public policy and community action. They also raise awareness for the community's media, opinion leaders, and the general public. Another effect is the alignment effect. So coalitions create a framework that brings together perspectives of various community players like libraries, low-income housing providers, and workforce agencies that share the common concern of digital inclusion, if nothing else. Coalitions create that strong united front. And lastly, they also create the networking effect. So by bringing in a range of parties together in one room, coalitions set the stage for their member organizations to better understand each other's perspectives, share information and strategic insights, and discover opportunities for new relationships, like collaborating with partner organizations and program partnerships. 
So there are a lot of reasons to form a coalition. So we'll go over a few. So most of the coalitions that were formed since 2020 formed because of the needs in their communities that the pandemic highlighted specifically for stakeholders who aren't doing digital inclusion efforts before. So some of the reasons to form a digital inclusion coalition are presenting a unified community voice through digital inclusion. We're always stronger together in numbers, right? And also another um, reason to form one is to raise funding for digital inclusion programs. Coalitions also strengthen the impact of digital inclusion programs through service partnerships. They also raise awareness about digital inequities and the impact it has on their communities by partnering with community organizations that directly serve those who are impacted by the digital divide. And lastly, coalitions also help develop a collective understanding about the need for digital inclusion among providers in specific areas of community development. So areas such as healthcare, education, workforce development, civic engagement, and racial justice. So one coalition that I want to highlight is the Digital Inclusion Network of Portland, Oregon, um, or known as DIN. So they were created in June 2014, and since then have grown to over having 45 organizational members. Their coalition guides Portland's digital equity plan implementation efforts and community engagement opportunities. They also center racial equity at the forefront of their coalition in three ways. So the first is by creating a shared language and understanding about racial equity, anti-racism, and digital inequities. Second, they ask the community how to address systemic barriers within the coalition and the broader community. And lastly, they implement anti-racist strategies within their coalition and connecting those strategies to the community and member organizations. So one of the strategies is to rotate the coalition leadership among the membership organization. And this allowed the original leadership of the coalition to step aside and create space and opportunity for those who are experiencing digital inequities. And what was the impact of that? The coalition is then able to learn to think in new ways. They are able to uncover barriers and are more in touch with the people the coalition wants to serve. I also want to highlight another great coalition um, and it's the Franklin County Digital Equity Coalition in Ohio. So in April, 2020, a number of Franklin County organizations came together through informal virtual meetings to examine the status of broadband challenges for their residents. Over time, this coalition has grown to over 35 organizational members and they meet several times each month and their digital equity framework highlights implementation strategies to bridge the digital divide. So we also have a awesome resource for you on the NDIA website, and it is their coalition guidebook that's been updated this year. So this guidebook, it's jam packed with juicy coalition information about how coalitions form, how what their structures look like, what are some best practices from successful models, the importance of racial equity when creating and centering these coalitions, and then ways coalitions adapt over time, because the issue of digital divide will always be adapting and changing. Next, I'll pass it over to Lo to briefly cover policy. So I think a lot of us are here today because we have been hearing a lot about the Infrastructure Act and a bunch of other things that have rolled out recently at the federal level that are talking about digital equity and digital inclusion in a new way. Um, on my next slide, I have a rough overview of sort of some of the things you may have heard about. The Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, um, I think we probably all heard about it. If we haven't already gotten like a uh, ping from our bosses about it, I mean, I know I have, but I do work at NDIA. So there's $65 billion we've been hearing a lot about, and it's broken out into a bunch of things that are particularly interesting and relevant to us. And I think these are some of the things you may have been hearing about. Um, if you guys want to give me a little reaction in the chat to let me know if this is one of the things that you have a lot of questions about, if you're newer to, go ahead. Um, the good news is I'm not the strongest person with policy, but my policy folks are here today. So if we have questions at the end, I see some waving. Don't worry, they're here for us. So um, we're, some things you may have heard. You may have heard about the Digital Equity Act. You may have heard about the Broadband Equity Access and Deployment Program. You may have heard about the Affordable Connectivity Program. You may have heard about the Tribal Connectivity Program. 
You may have heard about middle mile connectivity, and you may have heard from us about the digital discrimination section. So this is a lot of stuff. It's very complicated, but I mean, we can break it down into a few things that you should know on each one. Um, on the first one is the affordable connectivity program. I know that I talked about this one a little bit earlier, and I did mention that I encourage you to explore more on our website to learn more about the affordable connectivity program. One thing I will share, this is my like fun fact from it, is if anybody here was familiar with the EBB, that was the emergency broadband benefit that rolled out during sort of um, season two of the pandemic, I would call it, um, right when we kind of like understood how the pandemic worked and we understood all the characters and the plot line. Um, this is a monthly subsidy for a variety of different folks throughout um, the US and the territories to be able to have subsidized broadband. Um, there are a lot more details on this we'd love to share. So take a look at some of our resources on that as well. Um, the next one is the Broadband Equity Access and Deployment Program. Um, so this is going to be about states with broadband development to underserved areas. This one, I've got an action item for you. Um, to learn more about this and to particularly learn about some of these things, I would encourage you to take a look at the folks in your state. Um, learn a little bit more about who will be doing some of this work. Do you have a broadband office? Do you have an office of rural broadband? Is it called a digital equity office? Is it just called an IT office? Start learning a little bit more about um, where this kind of funding will land in your state or where you think it's going to go. Start building those relationships because for the next one as well, the Digital Equity Act, there are going to be a lot more state individual things. There's going to be a planning program to think about digital equity plans. There's going to be capacity grants and competitive grants. All of these things are going to be really expanded upon more in the coming days, so do keep an eye out for these. But this is also the reminder that now is the time to build connections in our communities. Now is the time to make friends, connect with um, folks in the offices surrounding you, and also to really bring attention to current work that is happening, whether it is your work or colleagues or similar programs, to acknowledge that digital equity is a goal we can achieve and there are folks doing digital inclusion things all around us. And then um, we have all of our other policy resources that I definitely recommend you take a look at um, because I am relatively new to policy. I will fully admit it. The number of times I have had to talk to our policy manager before going into a meeting or a program is a lot. Um, but Amy, Sion, and Josh are, I believe, on the call and will be taking some questions at the end if you need them because um, they are truly the experts. I'm grateful for them every day. What they did for us was they created a policy cheat sheet. So shout out to them for creating a policy cheat sheet that you can use too. I have used it a million times. Please take a look at it. They also made a fantastic webinar on ACP um, and they have some great ACP resources. Take a look at our policy and advocacy page because I guarantee it will be as useful to you as it was to me. Um, policy can be tough and learning about what's coming down on the federal level can be a little bit complex because sometimes you receive conflicting messages. So definitely take a look at these and when in doubt, do what I do and ask, ask an expert. Um, and then Pamela is our, as Pamela mentioned at the beginning, she's our community engagement manager. She takes care of y'all. Um, that's the best way I could describe it. I'm just gonna like gas her up for a minute. But what she does is she makes sure that everything that we do is accessible, everybody is getting needs met and that all voices are being heard. So Pamela, can you explain more of what you do? Cause I think it's really cool. Thanks, Lo. <laughs> um, so yes, I'm here to connect you. NDIA, we're all about peer-to-peer -peer support. We know that you are not alone. We're here to connect you with other folks in your community that are doing similar work or you want to partner with other organizations. We love to, to do that peer-to-peer -peer connection. So we would love for you to join our thriving community. There are three ways that you can join. You can become an affiliate or a friend, depending on your organization type. 
Both are completely free. You get access to our awesome monthly newsletter. Shout out to Yvette for always making that awesome. We also, you'll also get access to our popular and supportive community listserv. I like to look at it as such a supportive group chat where you're meeting with other digital equity practitioners and you get support. You can ask questions. So people, there are going to be people there who are answer, who are going to answer and share resources. Um, and the conversations there really help us guide what are specific things we need to be focusing on because we're listening to you all who are doing that groundwork. And um, you'll also get access to our community calls, which is every uh, third week of the Friday every month. Last month, we had members from the FCC come do a little presentation and a lot of it was a, um, a, a Q&A session, which we then were able to use those questions and answers and up uploaded and updated our ACP resource page. So it's a great community to be a part of, very supportive, and you're gonna get a lot of resources there. Uh, you can also become a subscriber. There is an annual subscription fee depending on your budget, but you do get the same benefits, plus discounts to NDIA events, as well as access to monthly subscriber calls and access to working groups. And then, Quick plug for something next year. It'll be our net inclusion that's going to happen in San Antonio. For those who were there in Portland, was that two months ago? You, you know the magic that happens at net inclusion. You're going to get connected to a lot of great practitioners, a lot of great um, breakout sessions that happen all in the real realm of digital equity work. So would like to plug there. All of our sessions that was that happened for the net inclusion in Portland are now currently on our YouTube page. There is a playlist of all the net inclusion um, workshops and breakout sessions. So please go there, um, watch it. It's it's so it's so juicy. I also had a panel there, so watch that. It's on digital inclusion 101. So perfect for all us newbies. All right. So now we've got 10 minutes for questions. Questions and answers, I want to take the time to thank you all for being here. The um, You can connect with Lo and I, our emails are right there. Um, I had a blast presenting, I hope you all did too. We will be sending out the recording, the slides, all the links that were shared in the chat. Thank you all for um, creating that peer-to-peer -peer space by sharing your own resources in the chat as well. And um, I'll pass it over to Lo if there's any uh, comments you want to make. Well, just another plug that, uh, yeah, Net Inclusion is our annual conference. Um, making friends, developing relationships there is really fantastic. I'm so glad to know that all of our panels are up. If this um, Digital Inclusion 101 met some of your needs and you're just not sure what questions to ask, definitely check out Pamela's that she presented there. Take a look at, um, I also coordinated a panel that was specifically talking about um, privacy and security in an inclusive manner. And um, a number of our community members were sharing, speaking, and engaging throughout all of those. Just another note on accessibility, while all of those are in video format, they are also um, transcribed and have captioning. So if that is um, something that's particularly relevant, those are available on all of those videos. And we wanna make sure that everything is accessible. So for net inclusion in 2023, please let us know if there are any accessibility concerns beyond live captioning, live transcription, um, that we can provide to make sure that everybody gets to hear what everyone has to say. So please hit us with your questions. We know it may take a minute or two for y'all to really process um, everything and that this was a lot of information. It's absolutely fine if your questions pop up later and you need to just email them to us. We would love to answer them once you've got them fully formulated. But what have we got for questions, friends? It looks like Jerry put a question in the chat. Does NDIA have an estimate on the length of time needed for broadband for all to roll out the last mile of those unconnected in the United States, just from a cables and wires perspective, not affordability? I think that's a question I would pitch to actually our whole community. I think that that would be something that we would ask our listserv. Um, we here at NDIA, I don't think that we could give a timeline exactly. Um, but any of my colleagues who are on the call definitely hop in. But that is the kind of question, Jerry, that I would definitely be putting into the listserv to ask my community. What what do we think the timeline is going to look like? Hello, I'll jump in. This is Amy. Amy. I, this is Amy, by the way, everybody. So this is Amy of policy, who I talk to far too much. 
Hi, friends. Um, Jerry, that's a great question. And I'm going to come back with the like the standard typical public policy answer and say it depends. So it really depends on the next few years and how the funds from the Infrastructure Act are spent and also on how the funds from all of the recovery funds are spent. So there were multiple funds that Lo and Pamela went over, the um, American Rescue Plan Act, those types of things. And it, it just really depends on the investments that are made and um, what technologies are invested to and how unserved and underserved are defined. Um, so if you're interested in advocating for it to happen on a shorter basis, which I know all of us are, um, I'd encourage you to talk to your state and um, and learn how they are planning to deploy the funds in your state. Awesome, thanks Amy. Does anybody else have any questions that they'd like to ask? We still got about five minutes left. Oh, do you know what federal agencies are discussing broadband? Amy, you're up again. So several federal agencies have uh, funds to ex uh, that can be used for broadband deployment, um, broadband adoption, and affordability. The main two are the Federal Communications Commission, which is a um, sort of independent quasi uh, independent agency, mm -hmm. and then also um, the National Telecommunications and Information Administration, which is a division of the US Department of Commerce, they will be deploying $48 billion from the Infrastructure Act towards broadband programs. A couple other agencies also are in this game, such as um, Universal or USDA and um, HUD, but uh, the major agencies are the FCC and NTIA. Thank you, Amy. Thanks, Cheryl, for the question. Any other questions we missed in the chat from earlier? Anybody, anything? Thanks, Joe, for sharing the resource. Map by country, that could be used as awesome. All the resources that you all shared, um, that hasn't been shared by NDIA staff will be included in our follow-up email. Well, if- You did a really good job if we don't have any questions right now. <laughs> or you can let it all sink in. Oh, thank you, Cheryl. Um, awesome. Well, if there are no further questions, thank you all for your time. Really appreciate. Um, just with the Jamboard activity alone, I know you're all gonna be awesome practitioners and advocates. And you all seem to know the issues in your community very well, very excited. Hopefully you can all join our community. We can stay in touch more and share, continue to share those resources to help serve our community. Um, all right, well, I will give you the last three minutes back and I hope you all have a great rest of the day. Thanks Lo, thanks NDIA team, thanks community. All right, take care. We look forward to those emailed questions too. Don't hold back. All right, thanks. Thanks friends. Bye. Have a great afternoon, y'all.